On this episode of NSFW Show, we're joined by C. Robert Cargill. Who's he? Well, shut your mouth. You should know by now. Man who wrote Sinister. The man who wrote Dreams and Shadows. Friend of this show. And if you catch me talking cross about him, I'm going to spit in your eye. And I don't know why I'm being so friendly about it, because he kicks the crap out of me, because I'm an idiot for the entire episode. Want to see me get punched around like a tetherball? Stay tuned. The NSFW Show. Netcasts you love From people you trust This is Twit Bandwidth for NSFW is brought to you by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com This is NSFW episode 164 recorded on February 5th, 2013 Dreams and Shadows. This episode is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audio book of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash NSFW. SFW. Yeah, that's right, the new show full of wind. You know the one. The one that's nominally safe for work. The one that's got a badass orchestral theme song put together by freaking talented musicians. It's amazing. Hey guys, I'm Brian Brusher, joined as always by my inimitable co host to be a Mr. Justin Robert Young. What's going on, GRY? What? Uh, I'm sorry, what? The goddamn music. I'm, what? Wow, all right. What the hell just that? Wait, was that a, an actual orchestra playing the NSFW theme? Or I, rather. I, that we used to be a song for a band, but now it's really our theme. <laughs> That's it. I feel a little bit dirty. I was sort of co-opted one of one of uh, uh, Kissinger's greatest hits. But uh, yeah, man, listen to this. This was put together. Uh, one of the guys who's been trying to help me out with, uh, I'm trying to set up like a liquor sponsorship to go on tour across America yeah. and do scam school stuff. One of the guys who responded to that tweet and introduced me to another guy just casually is like, hey, BT Dubs, uh, you know, I do music. Um, Just to give me fun to kind of, Write an awesome epic orchestral arrangement for uh, for Vicario. You think uh, Kissinger would be cool with that? I'm like, pretty sure Chris Kissinger. I'll, I'll forward it over to him. And, uh, so wait, and wait, when you say like write an orchestral theme, like is that like on a synthesizer? Like did a orchestra actually play that? Like I, what I, the hell happened? I don't think. I mean, Sanders' music is right here in the chat right now. If you look, Sanders' music is right here. It's sound. Now here's the thing. Whenever you think of doing it on the computer. Uh, you think that that's going to break the computer. Plus, I don't think it can support my weight. But, but also, you think of like crappy MIDI synth crap. No, no that's amazing. That sounds no, fantastic. Listen again and realize. It is synth, but like, no, I, no, no. I couldn't imagine it any other way. That's That sounds legendary. That's so awesome. So, okay, so listen. So here's, right, that's the original theme right there. And then, and then listen to, listen to this. So good. Wait for it. Here we go. It's like, it's totally, it, it's, it, he described it as Conanny. Conan the Barbarian. Oh, sounds great. Like, this is in like a, a movie 
movie trailer, I would be pumped to see that movie. I know, right? Where it's just like all, all, all I could be doing something awesome right now. I, like I getting out of the, the pool. Well, it was so good that I didn't want to just play it for what it was. I immediately called Zach Holder because I was grinning ear to ear, so excited. And I was like, I don't know what the visuals are, but all I can picture is like mountaintops and lens flares, which is, I think, you know, why. Brian, listen, if we're going to have a movie, God damn it, we need the best writer on the planet to put this story into motion. And you want to know what? I got just the guy. No, look, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, Michael Rooker, I saw his limericks and they weren't very good. And yes, no, he's a Hollywood no, no. insider, but it's, it's not, not far enough deep for our team. I got, I got a role for Rooker, though. Okay, well, okay, no, okay, I know. Brian you're, Brushwood. What? I would like him to play Brian. Wait, yeah. Okay, so Rooker plays Brushwood. Okay, yeah. you're probably asking the, for Greg Grunny Grunberg to be the writer. And I tell you, he's not a writer. He's he's lovable and adorable and one of the sexiest men alive on Heroes. Not, what? You're naming, you're naming actors, Brian. We don't know any he's writers. Writer. Name one writer who we know who's had, like, a massive Hollywood hit who also happens to be writing an epic fantasy novel, the likes of which none of us have ever seen before, that would be perfect to write the NSFW movie? Well, I would say it would have to be the man for which will soon be one stake heavier, C. Robert Cargill, <laughs> writer of Sinister, and the author of the uh, a brand new book, which he is flashing here in the Oh, my gosh. Death. It's what's uh, first of all, thank you very much, Cargill, for joining us. Always great to see you. What, what is the name of your book? Let's get this out of the way right up front. Uh, the book is Dreams and Shadows. It comes out uh, here in the States and in the UK on the same day on February 26th. And so, and uh, if, if you're going to give an elevator pitch to somebody who's unfamiliar with any of your other work or unfamiliar with our show, uh, what would you tell them about the book? Uh, Dreams and Shadows, it's the, the story of two boys who are uh, meet and become friends through supernatural means and uh, are brought together in, in uh, uh, I guess, uh, by, by fairies and other nefarious supernatural things. And it's all about how that kind of screws up their life and how it messes them up as adults. Right on. Dude, uh, so, so it's oh, sort of like... a minute. It's, it's a fantastic... Almost a fairy tale told through the lens of a very real, uh, like a very realistic uh, viewpoint, I guess. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, you refer to it as epic fantasy. Uh, it's actually, it's what's called urban fantasy. Sure. Um, it's, it's, or black uh, fantasy. They, they, I think, I think black is, they don't like urban anymore. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 that is not what that means. <laughs> okay, no, sorry. actually, it's, it's been compared to uh, Neil Gaiman and uh, Morgan Stern, Lev Grossman, uh, Del Toro, uh, and people seem to like it. So, uh, no, it's it's essentially it's fantasy that takes place in our world if things existed, and it takes place here in Austin where you and I live, and uh, it's about all the crazy things that might be lurking in the shadows. Right on, man. Uh, so, so, so would you say uh, coming of age? Would that be safe to say? Uh, to a certain degree, yeah. There's some co coming of age elements in it, dude. That but sounds also lots of amazing. Violence. Uh, oh. Where can people buy it right now? Uh, I'm sure it's available uh, right it on now Amazon. You can, can they run it over there? On Amazon at Barnes and Noble, uh, uh, anywhere, anywhere you can buy books, you buy your books, you can find it. You'll find it in bookstores. Uh, it's coming out in uh, in hardback on the 26th, and uh, you can buy the digital version for download. Uh, yes, right here on Amazon. Now, now is and this? I'll tell you what. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that uh, have probably already. Uh, I don't know how, but they've read the book in <laughs> our audience right that. now. Would oh, like to leave God. a lot of really good reviews. I'm just saying, like somebody's already given a five star review, saying I know it will be good. I wonder if anyone yeah, else who's watching right now is that confident where they would write a review even before it came out. That's crazy. The, the UK site has a lot of actual reviews on it. <laughs> this is one of my ex-roommates from like 15 years ago who I haven't seen in over 10 years. And the first time I see him, he's left a review on uh, on Amazon. Uh, um, he must have left quite an impression on him. He sounds pretty excited about the book. He does. He, he was, uh, to be fair, he was always a fan of my writing and always, he was one of the most... Uh, uh, confident and supportive friends who felt that I would actually have a career doing it. While everyone else is like, "Why are you writing all this stuff? Nobody's ever going to hire you to do this stuff." Yeah, He's bro. Like, no, Don't you you're know? You're wrong. Cargill can do it. <laughs> all the money's in sitting there critiquing other people's stuff. Continue to do only <laughs> that for the rest of your life. Stop trying.
Yeah, well, but uh, so no, it's it's cool that he left that there. But of all the reviews, you know, there's like 25 reviews on Goodreads and there's over half a dozen reviews on the UK site. You go to the American site, which has one one review. So. Uh, well, but it is Man, five stars. I'm sure that's really disappointing and will be the same forever. <laughs> Uh, hey man, so uh, when's the last time we had you on? I think it's been almost almost a year now. It was. It's yeah. It was coming close to. Uh, it's. I think it's over a year because we were a year away from the election last time I was on. Yeah, pretty yeah, close. So. Well, I, I remember that we didn't have a Republican candidate yet, and there were still the primaries happening. And a yeah. certain just Robert Young, uh, the butcher of Petaluma, as he's Amer often known, America's butcher. They call. <laughs> Snakes all over this great land. Oh, dude, I'm not. I'm not going to play the clip. But Justin made a very bold prediction. Is there a clip? Uh, oh, dude, clip? dude. Okay, chat realm is going to have it in like three seconds here. They've they've already played it and thrown it in our face before. I'm sure we'll have it in no time. So we'll we'll let uh, that happen. Yeah. So for those of you, this was it after show or was it on the show? I want to say it was show. after show. In I fact, feel like the show was very normal, and then we got into the big political discussion afterwards where people were like, they're talking to politics, we're out of here. Precious little yeah. honesty in the actual show. What we're doing is, is we put on our costumes, and we do our monkey dance, and then we collect our paychecks, and then you get the real talking afterwards. Absolutely. Right? So during that, I felt very, very confident that, uh, that uh, the president of the United States would not be able to, to uh, uh, retain his position and that his negatives were too high and that I thought that the best person of the Republican uh, presidential nominees was Mitt Romney to do it. And man, I looked really, 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 really smart after that first debate. And oh that my was God. the last time I looked really smart. Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, we got it right here. I'm going to go ahead and try to try to dig it up here. Let me move this over here. It's at the 50-minute mark right is here. going to have a strong showing if he runs. But I think Scott Brown is going to be the, the guy that appeals to the large Republican base because he he appeals to a lot of what the guys this time are grasping at, but lack the intelligence or records to be able to back up. I'll tell you, man. Uh, can, it I, just, can I yeah, can go. I make it can I offer a stake bet? Yes. Is gonna take there it, it is. Oh. Sure. God, man, I, I just want like a techno remix of you say, can I make a stake bet? <laughs> can I can I can I can I can I make a stake bet? Sure. By the way, watch the confidence. Have you ever, have you ever wondered? You ever watch me and I'm, I'm yelling about something with such confidence? You're like, where could such bravado come? From? I understand that it comes right out of my butt. I pull it like, 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 like a magician pulls handkerchiefs. I just reach between my legs and I pull colored handkerchiefs and throw them at the screen. It is amazing. Look at this. Oh no, there's not going to be a Republican primary in 2016. <laughs> oh, it's a double whammy because you're just like not only. Not only will he win, not only do I know which one will get the primary, not only do I know who's going to win this year, but I'm already looking forward like there, it's just not even a problem. This is amazing. Here we go. Romney is our next president, and it's by more than 5%. Really? You're talking <laughs> mandate territory? No yeah. way. I'll take that. Steak bet on I'll the line. Whoever wants to take it. Okay. Um, bro. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. How did you do that? How did you, son of a bitch? Y'all tricked me. Y'all totally tricked me. Gah! All right, here we go. All right, and now, now I want to check the uh, the the stake or the the belt bet. Somebody give me a link wait, to the belt. Wait, bet. can we go back to the point where he said not only did Romney was Romney going to win, but he's going to win by five percent. Five percent, yeah. Baby. You were nine percent off. The over under on that is amazing. Oh, yeah. Blown blown out of the goddamn water. Right there. Oh. We all put pinkies oh, man, up and everything. I can't wait till the week after election day. Two steak McGee, they're gonna call me. <laughs> You've already whatever happened to Two Steak McGee? Yeah, I, I think we. Guy. I think we should talk of call him Two Steak Two, McGee. Two Steak McGee. Two Steak McGee is living in in dreams and shadows, like the new book from C. Robert Cargill. Just promise me. Just promise me in like book eight of Dreams and Shadows, where your heart's no longer in it, and you're just cashing in on a franchise. You're just like you're you're just like um. And then he met a friend. 
Two steak McGee, <laughs> who had with the power to make steaks out of I'm his hands. I'm telling you, I write books about fairies, and you know, the Two steak McGee is a fair name for a red cap. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Two steak <sighs> right McGee. I'm gonna cook them both at the same time. <laughs> uh wow, really? Yeah. Now, now, why, why is? And if unemployment is high. You can't have unemployment this high. You can't have approval levels that low. This is the moment. This is the moment where you sort of lean back and just say, "Now that I've won in my imagination, let me tell you how I came to this amazing well, conclusion." I mean, like, the well, thing is, is that notice like, if you watch it, that clip, there's only one person leaning back in his chair, and it's the guy <laughs> who won the bet. Touche. Exactly. Although, I, by the way, uh, Cargill. Can we give to a shot of, of your set now and a year ago? <laughs> it looks like the exact same <laughs> this thing. This is this is what uh, people want to know. Like, what's it? What happened? What changes in your life once you've written like a big fat Hollywood movie and everyone and you've enjoyed part of culture? It's like, well, let me put it this way: this is the before, and this is the after. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, wait. Do you notice what the difference is? Go uh, back to the before. You've got a backpack. Well. What, see, if you look in the background here of what we could see right now, yep, yep. Uh, Sinister Poster is actually in the background of me now. <laughs> oh, the there it is. is. Safe poster. You know what? You're right. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good, actually. Now my office has a poster in it of my movie. Dude, I'll <laughs> tell you what. It's like um, I used to I used to get like super superstitious whenever you'd have the opportunity to like uh, like I remember the first time stupid tonight show jerked my chain about going on. And I remember I wouldn't say anything about it to anyone because I was afraid that something would happen. And I remember talking to all the spill guys when, they, you know, they're doing behind the screens on the WB locally. And they're like, well, I don't want to say too much because I don't want to jinx it or whatever. And then at some point you have enough crap crash and burn that you realize at this moment of anticipation, this moment of hope is the best it will ever be. So now, like I tell everyone, like I'm in a moment of hope. I, I think this thing might happen. And this is very likely the best it will go for me. Well, well, because also, by the way, that's the way that you self deflate. Because like when you're when you keep it in your head, yeah, then it is everything you could possibly imagine, because no one's going to tell you, well, well, I mean, like, you know, that's awesome. But you know, and even if they don't tell you that, you know that. And once you say it, you kind of self-regulate a little bit. Yes, exactly. But what do I know? I thought Mitt Romney was going to win by five points. <laughs> but man, look at the joy. <laughs> look at the joy in your heart at this moment. And to be honest with you, uh, the same reasons why, why Cargill is kind of disgusted by Romney now, this is the most disgusted that moderates will be in a very unfavorable environment for an incumbent. Oh. That turned out to not be true at all. Uh, and then enough. we found out all the terrible things about Mitt Romney. <laughs> that turned out to be not real. Uh, I think you know, unemployment was still high. Uh, uh, his, his, his favorables were, were, were still low. It's just that uh, Romney turned out to be a, a, a exceptionally... Uh, unremarkable candidate. <laughs> yeah, well, we the, the Republicans nominated Thurston Howell the third. I mean, what were you going to do? <laughs> there, there's it's actually like, a great. Oh, well, uh, I downloaded a great book. The the, uh, yes, exactly. What's that, Justin? Uh, I downloaded a great book from uh, Politico uh, about the election, specifically the last four months and uh, kind of what went went on. But like. You also kind of realize that- To like, talk Obama's constantly about how smart Nate Silver is, uh, as all books need to for the next 20 years for some reason? Uh, no, and I don't care if he was right. I still am annoyed by that dude. <laughs> like, I don't know what it is about him. Like, there's just, there's just something about that guy that bothers me. Uh, but, uh, yeah, well, no- You, but, you really don't like hanging out with people that know what they're talking about. Oh! <laughs> and and, and I, I think- no, yeah, all right, go ahead. And that's People why like you're here in with dreams us. and shadows, like the new book from Steve Robert Cargill. <laughs> there it is, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hey, man, let, let's talk real quick, because do you realize, like, since we last had you on the show, not only was, was there political hijinks, but, like, um, a year ago when you were on, I, I know that people say things like, your script will now be in a movie. And you hear those words and you sign pieces of paper. But 
you don't really know that you're going to get to go and sit in a theater and hear people clap and respond to words you wrote and you see your own name going up on, you know, in 1080p on 2K because they're too cheap to run 4K. Uh, but it's like, like, where was your mind at knowing that Sinister was coming but not having anything to show anybody that was substantial yet? I, you know what, I, I can't tell you. Um, it was, it was all a very weird experience. Um, it's, it, it, it's the, the, the best way to describe it is it's, it's like knowing Obama's going to win, but you can't prove it yet. <laughs> And, and like you know you're so confident you. that, that you're willing to bet stakes, but there's no ass lined up offering stakes left and right. And you just wish everybody would want to bet you a stake. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you know, it was, they did. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, this, can we just call the show? That's it. It's, it's, it's just a, this little vignette is, and in fact, Hold your thought. You think about what you feel like. Let's talk about our first sponsors, Justin. Who are the folks who are making this show? This show? Number one. Awesome. Let me just point out. Can I illustrate an element of this dynamic? That oh. there are two people very, very happy right now. Cargill is very happy because he's making a lot of really, really hilarious jokes at my expense. And his <laughs> happiness could not be measured on the same scale that Brian's is. <laughs> It's it's tough, Justin, because Ryan is radiating, radiating <laughs> happiness. I'm sorry. I'm a terrible friend. I'm a terrible co-host. But I sure no, shall. It's am. amazing. It's amazing to see you explode into light. That you're just you're just pouring light from every possible <laughs> socket. Oh my god. Okay. <clears throat> Four years ago this month, Scam School, we had done a pilot for it. We knew that it was picked up by Disco or, uh, Revision 3, now Discovery. Uh, and, like, nobody knew what podcasting was. Nobody knew the digital sway something like Dig had or Dignation or nobody heard. Uh, most of the people I knew uh, hadn't heard of, of, of Totally Rad Show. But meanwhile, I understood that there was a class of people who had a strong potential to dig the magic related stuff I was doing. And uh, and it was weird to have that secret, to know that we had, that we were already shooting these episodes, but not know if slash when and how they would be received and when they would be released or whatever. Like, like you, you didn't have any weirdness about that? Did you just blow it all off as just like, you know, like whatever? Well, you know, it was, it, it, the experience went in tears um, because, you know- You cried a when, lot. When the film was- was ramping up to be made. There was a lot of excitement and everybody around me was just really enthusiastic and we were really happy with the script. And we made the film and there was like this uh, two and a half month window before we did uh, the test screening. And there was just, some, you know, there was some light nervousness in there, but we were all confident. Then we did the test screening and the test screening went really well. Uh, so after that, there was a lot of confidence, but the biggest thing was wondering how my friends were going to react. Like I knew we were making a horror movie that that people would end up enjoying. No, all right, now, now when you say friends, in my mind, that I, I think like, yeah, what must it be like for his friends? And then I remember that uh, that at the time, the people you spent the most time with were your friends over at Spill.com, uh, the movie review site, where all of a sudden you had to go from movie reviewer, a critic, which which has its own you know reputation. For being somebody who sits on a on a bench and proclaims value in other people's works, to being a movie producer, like okay, walk walk me through this, take me through this, because because I don't have a bunch of magic critics as friends, because thankfully they don't exist. But well, I, I mean, I was I was a film critic oh, shoot, for a decade, and so uh, you know most of my friends are bloggers and writers uh, uh, who are film critics. So that was the big concern, and the thing is, is a lot of the people here in Austin, Austin has kind of become a center for movie blogging. So a lot of the creme de la creme of the movie review world lives here in Austin. So uh, if you read movie blogs, there's a very good chance that you're reading guys that that live in Austin. And uh, and that's who I go out to have coffee with. That's who I drink with. It's who comes over for my Christmas party. And so um, it was. it's showing that to your friends 
it's not the I'm going to pat you on the back and, and tell you it's great, even if it's not. It's the I hope this doesn't suck because I'm really going to hate writing the review eviscerating your terrible, terrible, piece which of I that. totally what, what, will what do. What is the worst case scenario like in your in your head? What is the doomsday scenario if if everybody for whom you have uh, been friends with for so many years in the Austin Critic community hates Sinister? Well, that that is the doomsday scenario. That's that. That was the fear. The fear was, you know, everybody seeing it and then hating it, and and thinking it was, you know, juvenile or trite or or not or worst of all, not scary. You know, we set out the the the, the chief goal of making Sinister was to make a scary film, a film that creeped people out, that genuinely scared them. That when you came out of the theater, you were like, "Holy crap, that was messed up. That scared the crap out of me." And that's what we we really wanted to do. Um, uh, and uh, and the, the fear was that we were going to make something not scary that everyone was just going to stare at and cross their arms and go, uh, yeah, this is why, like, for instance, just a moment ago in the chat room, someone that said, those who can't do critique. And uh, and that's very not true. I know there's a lot of really talented critics. Uh, I would, I would... I wouldn't even offer myself as an example. I would say Lev Grossman, the Time, uh, Time Magazine's uh, uh, book critic who then wrote The Magicians. Uh, there's uh, there's a number of film critics throughout history who who rose up to become you know uh, great film writers or directors. Uh, uh, in fact, the entire French New Wave were film critics that became uh, uh, became uh, auteurs. But essentially, what ended up happening was I had that fear for like two months of like, oh, what if my friends hate it? Oh my god, this is gonna be terrible. They're like, don't worry, man, we got faith in you. And I'm like, I don't know. Well, especially and, because they well, should be pointed out. The movie yet. <laughs> it, it's not like anyone is in the middle of production and trying to make a scene that's scary, and then they stop production to run over and ask the writer, like, hey, how should we frame this to make sure it actually scares people? When what you're selling is an emotional response, and when you go into that room, you're explicitly being promised you will have an adrenaline rush. You will have, you know, get bugs crawling up your spine, and it will be because of this movie. Part of that certainly is the story, but at some point, it's the it's the elegance of the execution of it. You have to know how to seduce people in, how to set things up visually, and then pop it so that you get the, you know, the bugaboo scares. And well, that's that's, that's my co-writer Scott, who also directed it. Yeah. So I there. okay. So, so that's the so, other so question. You, you had, you had, you had an inside line on on some of that creative uh, input. Here's, here's well, what yeah, I want to know. And, and as you said, uh, that was actually uh, wrong. What was weird about this particular uh, circumstance was I was on set the whole time with Scott, and Scott would come over to me every once in a while and say, you know, uh, what do you think about this? Does this jive with? with what we've got going on. Essentially, my job uh, on set was to make sure we adhered to the script that Scott and I wrote. Because we sat down, we we argued, we we went back and forth, we wrote for weeks, and we came up with a script, and we're like, this is the movie we want to make. And my job was to make sure we were adhering to that. And every once in a while, I'd come over and go, what do you think? Did that work for you? And and we talk about it. And he was really great about that. And, and I never overstepped my bounds and tried to take over and say, no, I'm the, uh, I need to direct now. You don't know what you're doing. But, uh, but he always, uh, he turned to me for counsel every once in a while. And we made a, made a movie we're really proud that's, of together. That's one of the weird parts about this, this business. Uh, and I'm talking about somebody who's an outsider. I'm so far at this moment, I'm a guy who knocked on the door of real TV production <laughs> and, and, it wasn't interesting enough and went back and like right now I'm finishing my my five years on the top of a, of a mountain in a Buddhist monastery learning how to kung fu fight so that the crap I'm pitching now hopefully will actually happen. But my impression as I go through this, when I look at the Hollywood side of things, is that um, for all the paperwork, for all the titles that everybody pisses all over each other to try to get their name above somebody else's name and whatever – when it really comes down to the art, the craft of what's actually made, it basically boils down to how much credit do you have with the individual making the indiv the specific decision at any given time, whether that's the editor, whether that's the director, and so on. And obviously, you are in a position to where you were able to speak directly to the director, which made a pretty big difference, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, no, it really does. And, and, and you're absolutely correct. You know, it is... It is all about how seriously they take you and and how much they respect your opinion. Um, you know, you know, 
Uh, sometimes you just got to say, no, Romney's not going to win. And, uh, <laughs> I'm confident in that. and then you prove yourself. And over time, you know, people come to trust your opinion and your appreciance to be able to look a year in advance. Okay, now, this is actually a good point because there are moments where I have, um, and again, I, I view what happens in new media as a microcosm of, of the kind of political crap that can happen in big Hollywood productions. But there have been times where over specific small issues where I'm like, no, you can clearly see the card that's supposed to be hidden under my hand. It, do not release this or, you know, it's always like a dot, dot, dot. You don't make a specific threat, but you're like, I'm spending all my clout to get that. Was there a moment like that where there was something that they were headed, like enough people wanted to head something uh, or head towards something on the show that you were like, no, I'm going to be the guy who's like, I, uh, I'm i going to go on the record. I'm not going to be okay with this. Let's make something happen. Um, Yes and no. I mean, there were a few points where Scott and I disagreed. Um, uh, there was one particular scene in the script where I, uh, I had written it a certain way and Scott had interpreted it another way. And we actually ended up in an argument on set about what that scene meant. And, uh, and that was weird. He, he actually got so mad at me. He picked up the script. He's like, read the script. And I'm like, I know the script by heart. It's page 56. It's down here. And this is, and he, he opens it up and he starts reading it. And then everybody's like, oh, and it's like, that really can be read both ways, can it? We just kind of looked at each other and said, oh, yeah, no, for some reason, we just didn't communicate properly on that. And, and we do as we always do. We hugged it out, and uh, and we said, well, we need to make a choice here and make a call, and then we made the call. You're, you're uh, a big fan of hugging it out. You hugged uh, Kevin Smith out as well. Hugging, hugging it out is how you take care of things, man. You got you to gotta make sure that when you have a uh, when you have some some bad blood with somebody that you don't let that carry out. And there's nothing quite like getting into the personal space and and, hug, and two men hugging it out to kind of say to each other, yeah, no, we really are cool with one another and you don't have to worry about it anymore. So yeah, no, I always, whenever I have beef with somebody, I hug it out. If they won't hug it out with me, they're not worth keeping around. So then, then you, know. you shiv it out. You just stab yeah. them in the liver a few times. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to name my next villain after you. <laughs> Or, uh, or, yeah, uh, obviously, you've, you've or written I, about. Or I accept a steak bet from them. Exactly. Yeah. What, what, what's that, just? And again, I'm coming to Austin for South by. Uh, hopefully, you can hear You didn't say by. that yet. I hadn't heard that. Oh, yeah. No, that, that's one of the things we're hoping to fix here. We have a proposed solution to, uh, to the Skype ducking issue because one of the things is because Skype knows that I'm on my side. It assumes that I'm more interested in what I have to say and what I'm playing. So as a result, every so often, Justin says things and it gets lost in the shuffle. But we think we may be onto a solution that we're going to work out on. So we'll see that. Speaking of which, uh, uh, Justin, you sound like you're about to say something. Yeah. Um, so you've obviously been uh, writing about movies for uh, a very long time. You know many people that are involved in the industry. Throughout Sinister, was there anything that was different than how you assumed it would go from your perspective before to somebody who was uh, in the process of writing, creating, and releasing a movie. Maybe even better. That'd be interesting to hear. Was there anything that was executed in a novel way where you're like, well, that's not what I intended, but wow. Oh, it sounds like you guys are asking two different things. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, I'll answer uh, uh, Brian's question first because it's very easy. Yeah, there were a number of things that in the script I thought would be good and then turned out great through Scott's direction or through performance. Uh, Ethan Hawke, really, man, the, the guy's a match. I, I love Ethan so much. He's so freaking talented. He really brought that character to life. Um the, the little kids we got were just fantastic and so much better than I thought it would be. There's so many, our, our cinematographer... Uh, uh, Chris Knorr just captured the film in a way that was so much better than it was in my head. No, the, the movie that ended up was better than what I thought it would be from the script. That's and awesome. that's uh, that, that just straight up, there's, there, there's very few things that uh, ended up on par with what I thought it would be. It was, it, it all turned out better. To answer your question, Justin, um, you know what really surprised me most was being on tour. And doing the uh, uh, the interview uh, junkets and uh, flying around, I did a we did a limited tour uh, the week before release, and we we uh, toured the East Coast, and you know went to Philly and Atlanta and Miami, 
And I had never done that before. And people always talk about how tired it is and how how strange it is. And and doing it myself, it really changed my view. I mean, I've been in, doing interviews for 10 years, yeah. but being on the other side uh, in the junkets all of a sudden explains so much behavior that I encountered as a critic. Um, all right, now, hold on. you you got you got to dive in depth on this one. You can't just let that flow. Like, give, give us a few specifics here. No, 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 I'm I'm getting there. Trust me. All right. No, it is one of the most. It's like I'm in the process of diving in depth. I know, but as the host, see, and this is the moment because I'm the interviewer. I need to take credit for prodding you in whatever direction you're about to take. Don't try, don't try to dodge the question, Cargill. Tell me what really specifically was weird about being on the other side of a junket. All right, all right, all right. You got me. I was totally going to slide out on that one. But, uh, yeah, no, the, the biggest thing is it is one of the most isolating uh, experiences I've ever had. Uh, I was on the road for just four days, and I was at the point where I was like, if I go to a fifth day, I'm actually going to go into strange mental places. Uh, no, it is... Um, because I mean, let, let me give you a rundown. You may have, I think you may have read this on my uh, on my Facebook. Uh, but uh, essentially, you know, when you're on one of these tours, um, you're working for free. You know, you you they aren't paying you to go on this tour. So what you're getting paid is in um, first class treatment and and experiential stuff. Well, and, so and hopefully, you theoretically, you're being because this is something that that I've we, Justin and I have talked about before. Is that there's different currencies for everyone. There's certain people for whom the only thing that matters is the monetary currency. Other people. Uh, will consider fame as a, an important currency or the feeling of fame. Uh, other people, you know, uh, experience is a currency that matters the most to them. Uh, but as far as monetary currency, definitely. You're not getting jack on that. Wow, I almost earned the yeah. bet again. But yes. Yeah. So, so I mean, it's it's weird. You know, uh, you're, you pack your bags, you're ready to walk out the door, and a car shows up to pick you up to take you to the airport. Right. And, you know, there's a nice gentleman there who holds the back door open for you. You get in. And from that point on, you do almost nothing for yourself. Um, I get dropped off at the airport. I've got first-class tickets. I'm sitting in first class. You know, I sit down. The, the You know, the, uh, the stewardess comes up. Uh, can I get you a drink, Mr. Cargill? Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Give me this, yada, yada. Uh, you step off the plane, you walk down to the receiving area, there's somebody with a, a card with your name on it, uh, you walk up to them, they're your rep, and they take care of you until they put you on the next plane. Right. So, you know, all of a sudden you're whisked away in an SUV, you're going to a four or five star hotel, um, <clears throat> anything you want, you just, you sign your room number for and they take care of. Uh, but at the same time, you are totally at their mercy. They're like, okay, you've got this interview at 7.30. Be down here at 7.15. We'll take you in the uh, who, car. Who's, who's they? What? Who's they? Is this, is this the studio? This is this, uh, the, the whatever rep company is hired by the studios, yeah. Okay. And, and there's different reps in different cities uh, for different studios. Um, and they are the sweetest people on the planet. They are absolutely wonderful, but they have your, they're, they're just dragging you around and you just have to do whatever they, pretty much whatever they say. Um, and it's a very weird kind of dynamic. And so, um, you know, there's one point where it's like, hey, I need to get some bubble gum. And they're like, what do you, what kind do you want? And I'm like, oh, I'll just stop at the store and get it. And they're like, no, what kind do you want? I'll go in and get well, it. Well, and keep and in mind, I mean, you're you're aware. It's not like you're deluded at that moment. You don't, you don't actually think, and I don't think most of the people in this situation actually thinks that any of these people really give a good goddamn about what kind of uh, bubble gum you want. But like you are meat that must be handled at all times as if to be paid out for a very important stake bet between studios. Uh, but the uh, uh, but but like, is there some part of you that feels, I don't know, trapped in that? Because there, there's got to be there's the way everybody fancy pants is around you when you're on a junket, and then there's in my imagination. Uh, from what little experience I've had in a similar area, you sit down and you get the bleary eyed, disinterested gazes of whatever local media are here asking you the same five questions that everybody else asks. Well, yeah, and that's where things start to get really weird because up until now, it, it sounds like what is Cargill bitching about? That sounds amazing. Right. You know, that sounds that's why you're that that's why you become rich is so you can have that experience every day. But the problem is where they're taking you is they're taking you to various interviews and you go, you know, we're going to a television station first for a quick five minutes, 
Then we're whisking you away again to a radio station where you're going to do 20 minutes live. And then you're going to go over into the next room where you're going to do a pre-recorded with the other station for later. And then we're back to the hotel and you've only been gone an hour and a half. And there's you're going to do four straight hours of interviews. And you sit there and that's where you have the same five questions over and over again. And the thing is, the worst part of it, the part that, I mean, everybody's heard that part. What they don't tell you is that there's no time between the person that leaves and the person coming in. They're tagging off. So you don't even get a minute to sit and process or relax or lean over to your, your writing partner and, and exchange a few words about something. Uh, you don't get a break. It's, it's quite literally four straight hours yeah. of, of just talking. All right. Uh, one more quick question, because I'm sure we got to move on to other stuff here. But it's like, is there some part of you, was there ever a moment you decided, like, screw it? What does it matter? I'm going to get creative. And you'll start playing your own games with it's like, I'm going to see how many times I can use the S word in this. or No, whatever. you don't have time to think. You don't have time to think about playing games because you just, at that point, you're just reacting to everything and trying not to look like a fool or an ass. And uh, you, you quite literally, you're just so blitzed by just this constant state of talking and forgetting who you told what. And, and you can't, you haven't processed the person's name because you haven't given, had a second to think about who you're sitting across from. Uh, and you're not going to remember them when they walk out the door, not because they're, they're of no use to you or any, any horrible thing like that, because you haven't had a, a second to acknowledge who they are and, and listen and- They're meat. Them, find out who they are. So it's just this big blur of faces while you talk and then as soon as you're done you're immediately whisked off they say hey go up and grab your stuff from your room we're putting you on a plane and then you're next thing you know you're in an airport you're on first class again and you're going to another town and there's a new person meeting you at the at the bottom of the escalator and then they take you to a new hotel and then you've got new interviews and new blurs of faces and you lather rinse repeat 24 hours a day, every day. By day four, you're just like, oh my God, where am I? What am I doing? Sure. I have no idea what's going on. Okay. And I can't do another day of this. So, so, so real quick. Uh, oh, hold, on, uh, also, hold on, wait. Somebody in the chat room is like, talk about first world problems. <laughs> Listen, like you don't, uh, you, like you really, really can't comprehend. Like this is sensory deprivation. Like it, it, it could be, you just sitting in a room by yourself, which would be far cheaper way to achieve a similar effect. It is just distorting your reality because it's breaking up the pattern that we assume to be human interaction and life with, yes. by just doing the same feedback loop over and over and over and over again. And the, the thing is, is the reason why everything is first class and you get whatever you want is because it's the only way to make that blur uh, worthwhile and have people come back and do it again. Because once you've done it once, you're like, I don't want to do that again. And then you think, well, you know, that hotel in Miami was really sweet. And uh, the, it did have serve the best steak I've ever had in my life. And it really was kind of magical. And maybe, maybe it won't, maybe I was just feeling weird last time and I'll go and I'll do this again. And uh, no, the, the person is right. I mean, it does sound like the king of all first world problems. And I would have not believed it until I experienced it myself firsthand and was like, wow, but you nailed it, Justin. That's what it is. It's 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 like sensory deprivation. It is, it is, it, it is lose like your sense of self. It is, it is the loneliest prison that you could imagine. But on top of that, it's a gorgeous prison, plus also a significant chunk of the world is watching you in it. And it and it just totally screws up your ability like you don't even know how you should be like imagining second guessing everything you do all the time which i'm sure a lot of us have experienced but just but just upping the ante like this is my dream project i'm here to support it also uh everybody's gonna jump on me the first chance they got to to, to shove anything in my face it's it, I, I i can't even imagine people are saying gilded pages in the audience and i think that's exactly well, right. listen, listen, I mean, yeah. this uh, he is describing the weirdest part of this process. I'm sure if you were to ask, I will ask you Cargill, if you were to say do press junkets every year or dig ditches, you'd probably do press junkets. Like it's hey, not yeah. the worst thing on the planet, but it is a weird thing for which he is describing. That's yeah. all we're saying. 
Well, the, yeah, no. In fact, what it, the 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 big thing that it answered and the blank that it filled in for me that I never knew as you know, interviewing celebrities for ten years, had lots of great experiences, lots of great evenings with folks that are, were on the junket, and then you run into them six months or a year later, and they have no idea who you are, and yeah. and it's like oh, and and you get this immediate feeling like oh, I guess you were just acting like we were getting along, and you really didn't. You know, oh, give her okay, ass. how about this for the reverse? Because like five, uh, what six years ago. <laughs> I, I went on, uh, the, the only people say like, what it, what happens when they epically fail? And it's like, if you fail at a show, whatever, it's like you're in a different city the next week or whatever. But like, there was one time here in my hometown, I went on the local radio and did an appearance and I spent like five minutes building up to one mind reading trick. And at the end, I got it effing wrong. It was 100% wrong and there was no salvation. And I just was like, eh, well, whatever. And I tried to blow it off. But meanwhile, like I just, failed at at a radio show that was here locally and then like uh but then i consoled myself saying like well nobody remembers nobody cares whatever and i was like except for the people who were there they'll know they'll know they were there and uh nobody remembers you predicted romney to win the election by five percent <laughs> <laughs> exactly so then once again sir you are wrong <laughs> so then ah, jesus christ so then uh, uh, Scam School launches and a PR company pays me or, or they don't even pay me. They, they they pay for whatever their press releases. They get me back on the same show. And I was like, OK, one of the things that's going to happen is they're going to remember that I was on the show. They're going to play the clip. Well, blah, blah, blah. And we'll both laugh it off. I'm ready. I'm ready. And we did the whole thing and they never mentioned it. I was like, wow, they never mentioned it. And then I go and I listen to it. Uh, after I leave, and they're all like, oh, that, that kid looks like he's going places. Look at him. His show is pretty good. And then I watch the YouTube clip of the of the DJ does like a driving home little analysis, and, and he's confessing to his audience, we met a new guy named Brian Brushwood who I really think is going places. And then it hit me that the only person who cares about my massive abject failure in front of 50,000 listeners live was me, and I was like, I was the one person who didn't want to care about it. Oh, well, Brian, Brian, climb down off the tower, put down the rifle, take the pantyhose off your head. <laughs> I'm just right? saying. Nobody needs to get hurt here, Brian. I'm no just one saying. Needs to get hurt. Wow. Nobody, nobody can turn an interview into a screaming, self-evaluating <laughs> therapy session like Brian Breslin, huh? And with wow. that, I think yeah, it's no, time. No, you're absolutely, no, but I think it's more than that. The fact is, you're looking, you're talking about a morning show where they're doing four hours a day, sure. every day for, you know, five days a week, 52 weeks a year, year in, year out, that it all becomes a blur. And you have no idea that this guy who did this great trick is that same guy from three years ago who blew it sure. because that was just a bit that didn't work and they you moved on. Sure. And it's exactly how and, you're like, oh, I guess that, you know, it's it's when you, you know, just sometimes, you, you know, that you, you your mind just does that. And that's exactly, that, that's waking that's exactly up, what this was. And all that, of a that's sudden. waking up every day at 3 a.m. if you're a morning show. Oh, my God, dude. Can you imagine, like, which would you rather do, dig ditches or wake up at 3 a.m. every morning? No, I would actually day. rather, well, I don't know. Depends on how much I'm getting paid for the morning show. <laughs> Is that, I don't want to close any doors here, Brian. Every morning, but you just go to bed earlier. That's just how it works. <laughs> okay, so real quick, uh, we, we do have we do have a shenanigan to get into here. But first, got to thank our other sponsor. Who, who else is on the, the agenda? Let me consult our awesome epic orchestral opening that I don't have open anymore. Son of a bitch. It was really, oh, wait, wait, here we go. Audible.com! Yes. Remember when I said that they weren't sponsoring? I was a liar. Audible's back, man, in a big way. And in many ways, they never left because Audible has been providing to you high-quality audio books that I know me and Brian and Cargo, are you an audio book guy? Uh, generally, no. I'm as a writer. Well, I'm also screw a you and your printed words and your however, eyeballs. However, the book "Dreams and Shadows" will also be available as an audio book, also around the same time. Read by the author. Who's it read by? Uh, it's uh, read by a guy named Vicus. Uh, oh, I'm blanking on his last name. Uh, Adam, I wasn't prepared for that sure, question. Out of Vicus, uh, Adam, in the chat. Very, very cool guy, uh, great guy who does a lot of audiobooks. Do, do you have any input on it? Do they come to you for this kind of thing? They're like, who do you, what, what kind of voice do you want? 
Well, it, it all depends. Everybody gets a different experience. I know Ernie Klein, they came to his his publisher came to him and said, could you make a list for us? And he made a list uh, with me. They came and said, hey, we auditioned this guy. We really like him. We think he's perfect. Would you read a couple of uh, uh, listen to a couple of his samples and uh, tell us if, if, if it's a if, if we should go with him? And I listened to the samples, and they were fantastic. And I'm like, yeah, no, this guy sounds great. So, yeah, that's that. Yeah, it, everybody has a different experience. It all depends on uh, who their publisher is and uh, um, how that publisher is choosing to deal with that particular author. So uh, there are several things that I had lots of feedback on and several things where they were uh, more like, hey, here's the single option. Is it okay or not? And, yeah. Uh, and that's just how the industry gets. So, so, uh, but most importantly, do you know whether or not you'll be on Audible.com? Because Audible, I don't know if you know this, is the nation's largest supplier of uh, audio entertainment of all varieties. Everything from uh, famous that speeches. Amazing. That's uh, yeah, that, that's from my heart is what I'm saying right now. I'm just saying. Throw, wait a minute, hold on. It's actually up on Audible right now. People in the chat room. Holy crap, balls, McClanahan. There it is on Audible.com. Wow. Look and at that. Wait, how just, many how many credits is it? It is uh normally 26.45, but guess what? You can get it for only $7.49 if you sign up for an account. And it's 13 hours. I got to assume it's one credit. That's you can get it credit. for free. Here's the deal. You can get that free. I'll tell you what. Package that on up and stuff it right in your ear hole and then roll it around in there. Let it ferment. Let the dreams and shadows seep into your cortex and let it marinate your brain to the point where you spew awesomeness. Because C. Robert Cargill's words tickled your goddamn cerebellum until you vomited hilarity. Here's the deal. Go on over to audible.com. 100,000 downloadable titles of all types, literature, including nonfiction, fiction, and periodicals. Uh, head on over there right now. It's the best thing ever. And I'm trying to find the, the code. But uh, I can't. All right, look, while you're looking that up, I'll explain to everybody. Here's the thing about Audible is that it makes you smarter because there are books that I, can I can I confess something kind of a little bit weird? I think it's been four years since I've actually read an entire book in physical format. Like I'm at the point now where the real time exchange of printed words to knowledge in my head just strikes me as so inefficient and stupid that I actually hold contempt for the printed word. You can't wash dishes while reading the printed word. You can't drive a car while reading the printed word. The printed word is dangerous and stupid and the menace of the printed word must be stopped. And uh, Go I'm going to I'm going to say Audible is made possible. I've become smarter. I've become I've experienced more joy and more amazement in my life thanks to it. And if if it were up to me, we would set fire to every book in America and replace it with spoken word. Well, I mean, here you realize you realize you're going to burn in hell for that, right, Brian? No, uh, you know what'll burn are all them effing books. Wow, I almost cursed. That's how passionate you, I you am. You know, you know who's you know who communicates to you through the printed word, Brian? Who? Chat realm. Uh, yeah, but they ain't writing no long books. I'm just saying uh, long. And books. also, we have chat realm audio. We can turn that on at any moment. <laughs> it is it is a fully functioning feature for which we can implement at our whim. Here's the deal, audiblepodcast.com slash NSFW. That's where you're going to get your free trial. That's where you're going to get your free credit that you will go to use to buy Dreams and Shadows by C. Robert Cargill, the debut novel by the man who was on our show right goddamn now. Dude, uh, it real, real quick. Best, let it is, it is the, the best thing ever. And let me just say this. I'll, I'll straddle the line between Brian and, and Cargill here. Yes, straddle us. Uh, reading an audiobook is is just it, it's another layer of how to enjoy some of your best literature. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what the the, new, the Hobbit book uh, that they that they released is awesome. They, the dude who read it was was super is, is super awesome. The uh, voices are great. The singing was awesome. Uh, it is just a fantastic way to experience all your favorite stuff. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash NSFW. Yeah, and, and and by the way, there are certain things where it might be a stretch and you could tell that we're outside of our environment. Uh, Audible and Squarespace, neither of them are, we're outside of our, our, our element. We're, we're both subscribers to both. We are, right? we are. Well, and people who, who are in a, the type of job where we need to take advantage of both. So yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, so look, we uh, well, I don't know if you remember, Cargill, we played a little game a little bit, a little while ago where you brought to us certain Oscar contenders. And because Justin and I are so up to date. I, 
I was supposed to do some research on that today, wasn't I? Uh, oh. you, you got like 30 more seconds while I continue to set up this bit. So here's oh, the thing. dear Lord. Real quick, let me talk to Justin. Hey, Justin, I don't yeah. know about you, but I keep up with all the Oscars. I keep up with all the nominees. Oscar and Madison. Yep. Oscar Robinson. Oscar, Oscar Wilde. Oscar, Oscar De La Hoya. Uh, Oscar, Oscar Meyer. They're, they're all in there. Uh, and in fact, I'm so into the Oscar th that I especially pay attention to the foreign films nominated for Oscars. That's why I always make sure to find out what they're about, who they star, and most importantly, the plot synopses of what's supposed to happen in them. So as a result, when well, we get... Mean you, I mean, Brian, just to let people in on, on a little secret sauce, uh, very often, uh, me, I will call you, or you will call me, and we'll be, just be like, oh, my God, did, I just got out of this foreign film. Let's discuss it in depth. Of course. That, that's a common thing that we talk about. That is us. Uh, yes, and so as a result, when we get somebody who's in the film industry, somebody who has a background as a film critic, somebody who has his finger on the pulse at all times as to what's happening in the Oscars, we love for someone like C. Robert Cargill to test us, you know, put us on the spot and challenge us and see how much we know about the latest nominees but uh, uh, Cargill, should I just should I just play the epic NSFW intro again? I I could just I could just play. Maybe maybe, or maybe we'll go back uh, to this to a candidate that by and large just needs to play <laughs> yeah. not to lose, and it's not in the same way that Kerry was against Bush. Number one, I think uh, Romney is a better by about ten to fifteen percent candidate than Kerry. I think Kerry made a lot of ten to fifteen percent better than than Kerry is 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 what you were saying at the time. How do you feel about that now? Uh, I mean, it's something he's. Probably marginally better, but not 10 to 15 percent. No. I see my percentages where we're very, very, very far off. Cargill. Yeah. Hey, buddy. You got, hey. <laughs> you got a you got you got a, a foreign Oscar pick for us to, because we, I'm pretty I sure do. we know all of them. I do see the the thing is is had you asked anything else about the Oscars, I've seen everything else, <laughs> but because they don't send out screeners for the uh, uh, for the foreign picks, right? Because they're a, they're they're uh, and because some of them don't come out until later. Um, I'm not up on this year's foreign picks. And you're like, oh, we'll do foreign. And I'm like, oh, I really don't know them this year. You're like, oh, no, it'll be fine. You'll just Google it. It will it's be like, fine. It's like, okay, well, I'll Google it. And then I got several work calls about films I'm working on and totally forgot. And then, of course, it was free pancake day. Because uh, who loves free pancake day? Uh, dude, I, there's not a, this is the first time any level of unprofessionalism has ever happened right here on the NSFW show. So... We'll we'll just jump into it and we'll go with pick number one of the foreign uh, uh, Oscars this year yeah. from the wonderful world of Norway. Norway, I love Norway. I lived Norway. there once. Who, does, who doesn't love Norway? Norway is truly an amazing country. The Swedish. That's who doesn't <laughs> love Norway. Well, but you know, it's Sweden. Uh, the <laughs> film is titled Kontiki. Oh. K O N dash. T I K I, Contiki. This I love that one. That one was great. What's the plot summary of Contiki? I saw this one because well, for, uh, this stars who again? What was it again? Oh, that was, uh, I mean, the great Norwegian actor. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> give, me, give me the real actor. What was the real actor? Really? No, 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 it was, um, it was, it was Hans. Come on. <laughs> okay. If I remember correctly, this is the tale of how the Contiki was going to go across the Atlantic, but instead, about halfway, something dark, something sinister manifests itself, and they begin no. to suspect that the, bo the, the boat is haunted. Uh, no, I mean, well, I mean, of course, that's the first 15 minutes, Brian. <laughs> the rest of the movie uh, is, uh, of course, listen, a, a lot of people are really, really, really getting excited about this new Star Trek movie. So the rest of the movie is uh, a CGI recreation of Khan from Wrath of Khan. Uh, oh, Ricardo Maltabon 
in a Hawaiian adventure, the likes of which we'll never forget. Now I remember. What happens is they start off on the Kantiki trying to make it to America because they want to immigrate. And uh, what happens is somewhere they develop warp technology and they go past America. They end yeah. up landing in Hawaii where Khan very frustrated that he plast, plowed right past America, decides to open up a fantasy island where people can have their best fantasies come true. Absolutely. And then Romney wins the election. <laughs> and everybody, and it rains stakes at the end. That's, that's pretty much how it went, right? Right, Cargill? That's right, Cargill. <laughs> the ending is closer than the beginning, actually, um, in truth. No, it is the story of a Norwegian explorer Thor uh, <laughs> crossed the Pacific Ocean in a balsa wood raft in 1947 to overcome his fear of swimming and uh, other such Norwegian abnormalities. Pretty much right on target. If I if yeah. my math works out here, I think we pretty much nailed this one. Yes. All right, so let's go to the next one, which is, of course... A lot of people's pick for uh, the not only best foreign film, but something a lot of people think is the best film of the year, a film directed by Michael Haneke titled Amour. What 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 country is it from? Uh, I think I want to say Germany. I, this, I think sure. uh, I say Germany. I think, it's it's I, from. I think Haneke's German. I, I know what this is. I know what this is. Somebody. It's about a man who yeah. wants to kill himself. And so he goes to a bar, and for some reason, it's all in English, but he speaks with a thick German accent, and they say, uh, are you finished drinking? And he says, a more. And he just keeps on drinking. Uh, but what happens is he starts to have hallucinations, and it's unreal. The adventure is he goes on right before he thinks he dies. But what you find out in the third act, Brian, uh, spoilers here, is that uh, he really isn't who he says he is. What? Uh, in fact, he's the Submariner and has <laughs> cut the N off his name. Uh, it, it, he used to go by Namor, but now he is Amor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. He says, he says, look at these wings on my feet. I'm Amor. <laughs> now pour yes. me Amor, Amor. beer. Amor. Amor. <laughs> and he's drinking. And it's really sad because he used to be the king of the sea. Yes. Now he's just a random drunk. Uh, yeah, no, I'm pretty sure that's how it went. Car uh, Cargill, how close were we? Uh, pretty close. Uh, except that it's about an old couple in their 80s who are in love and things go terribly wrong. <laughs> right. Also, one of them is Prince Namor. <laughs> Basically. I mean, I feel like, Brian, like... Two for, uh, two for two, we, right? We've seen all these movies. I think it's very clear. <laughs> uh, you know what? Um, I think I think this is the perfect on, place give, to give go me, from here. Give, give me just one second here, Cargo. Hold on. Just um, imagine for one second that in the Oscars, there really was a foreign film that was about like an obvious unlicensed ripoff of the Submariner story from a Marvel comic who wanted to get drunk and decided to use an American, like, essentially a pun of English. Uh, would, would that be the greatest thing that happened in your lifetime? No. The greatest thing would it be would it being revealed to be a deliberate extension of the Marvel Universe. <laughs> Bought by Disney. All right. What, what do you got for us, Cargill? From Chile, we have the film titled... No. <laughs> Tell us who are the principal. What is no about? How is it spelled? <laughs> this is like a spelling bee. Could you N O. Could you use it in a sentence? <laughs> no. Who are the actors? Uh, Brian, I, I think you go ahead and start telling us what it's about. Uh, you know what? Um, no is a movie about defiance. No. Okay, that's uh, what you're doing right now is you just, you're, you're just... No. Okay, you can't, you, that's not helping. You're not... Uh, are you waiting for me to actually... No. I, okay, see, look. Okay, look, here's the thing. The movie, the movie, no. 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 The movie, no. No. 
Do you think? Do you think they never no? say? Uh, what? What no. else? <laughs> this, how? How can we even? We can't even do anything. No. Okay, look, this is not even gonna work. Are you in your? And the moment no. I. If I'm not mistaken, Cargo, no. that's that's pretty much the movie, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, except there's this small little part about an ad executive who uh, tries to come up with an ad campaign to beat Pinochet. Yes, but but that scene we just Aside recreated. That, that the was his thing about the no. That I think yeah, that I think that's verbatim is <laughs> from the script. Uh, I'm it's not sure, <laughs> and if it isn't, I'm writing that down and stealing it and putting it in my next movie because that is comedy gold. So it's not a movie about anal sex or attempted thereof. Well, everything is about anal sex, even <laughs> if it's in metaphor. And have you seen Bratz the movie? Touche, sir. <laughs> well spoken. All right, what, what, what else is up? No. Uh, okay, let's, let's go to the untamed wilds of the north, to Canada. Canada? The film War Witch. War Witch, like W A R W I T C H. Yes, dude, this sounds freaking epic. Well, you know, to be honest, Brian, listen, I'm gonna go have to uh, be very honest here and say I haven't seen this film. However, I think we're all all familiar with the hit single on its soundtrack by Exhibit. This is War Witch, bitch. Uh, okay, well, uh, I, I, right, but 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 the movie itself, I mean, were there any context clues from the rap song that, that we're able to clue you in? Because oftentimes they write these theme songs about the movie, so I'm just wondering yeah. if maybe that yeah. clued no, you it's in. About, it basically explains the plot of the movie, uh, but it, it, it weaves in some of his, his real uh, intricate jibes to uh, others and uh, people around him, but he really is just talking about how much he loved the movie. <laughs> So it's not even it's not even that he's actually saying this took uh, war witch. Yeah. yeah. Do you think it's about a war with witches? Like witches at war? Uh well, according to the exhibit song, it's about uh, uh war weary witches that have been at war for many years, but war weary witches was just something too that difficult to say. So you long. call them war yeah. witches, so you right? You go war witch. Um now yeah. what? Okay, so there is one particular lyric where he says, "War witches be bitches and snitches." Is that does that occur in the movie? Is that is that in there? Well, I mean, again, I haven't seen it, Brian. <laughs> uh, well, but I think you're confusing your B's with your W's. Well, I think the song is "Bar Bitches." Well, I, he does mention bar bitches and witches yeah. and snitches. Bar bitches ain't war witches, snitches. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much the entire second verse. Is it about like barbiturates, but they call them barbiches, and then somebody who can't properly form his words calls them somebody war witches? Somebody who's out doesn't work says, give me some of that war witches. Yes, that's actually the pivotal scene. If I remember correctly, it's a very movie scene where an entire family is doing barbiturates, or as they call them, barbiches. And finally, somebody walks in, and and, and again, it's it's uh, it actually it's um oh god damn, why can't I remember his name? What's the actor? <laughs> Who am I, I don't know, but he moves his mouth like this. I'm on moment. It's, it's Sean I'm Penn. Sean Penn, Penn in a very that. moving speech. <laughs> Sean Penn comes in and asks for barbages. <laughs> How close are we, Cargill? I can't even fake that one. <laughs> it is the story of a 14-year-old girl living in a sub-Saharan African nation war torn by war. It is a very serious and deeply moving movie uh, that you have just uh, turned into an exhibit song. <laughs> and, so uh, here's the I thing. I think you've actually passed, surpassed Jappel. And your coonskin hat for today's real, most real expensive, um, uh, real uh, racially okay. insensitive moment. Yeah, there's only one way to make things right, and that's for somebody to go watch this movie, take clips of it, and edit together the exhibit video uh, that goes at the end of our version of the movie. With Yo, the dog, I one. heard you like war witches. <laughs> so I put some war into your witches, bitches. Barbiturates. Barbiturate Philippe. Barbiturate. Yes, that that happened. <laughs>
That that's, was a thing. That's, that's some SEO right there, my friends. <laughs> yeah. With, uh, so, so who do you think is <laughs> the next election? <laughs> what else? Uh, what else we got, man? Well, how many how many Oscar nominees do you think there are, sir? There's one left. Good. So, right? uh, how about from Denmark, a royal affair? Oh, dude, a royal affair. Well, come it's on, about listen, butterfly. me and Brian, I mean, we spent hours talking about this one, right? You know, I especially, it's about the forbidden love between a monarch butterfly and a viceroy butterfly, which, as we all know, mimics the patterns of, it's an animated affair. It comes from Japan, if I'm not mistaken. But um, they all have, you know, the big bug eyes that bugs have. And uh, the, the dance scene is delightful. Didn't care for the attempted rape scene. Was happy to see King Monarch pop him in the nuts. Sure. Uh, Brian, that's wrong. Uh, that's not what this did, movie is did about. Did we not watch the same time. movie? I mean, I understand no. there's a deeper meaning, but that's what I was watching the whole no, time. You were thinking of a royal affair, parenthetical, <laughs> butterfly version. Uh, oh, did I watch the wrong movie again? Because I'm almost certain. You did. The a royal affair is <laughs> Denmark set recreation of the 1993 WWF Royal Rumble where <laughs> Doink the Clown... <laughs> Dressed, he, he, he was dressed as a butterfly. Each other's he was what was dressed as a butterfly, uh, or uh, what was dressed as a viceroy, the other as a monarch. Uh, that, that didn't happen either. No, it's the Royal Rumble. <laughs> of Ro it's the, the Royal Rumble. That's where the Royal comes in. The affair is them just getting in there into a real tight scrum and trying to work three inches of finger. But, but, but the Rumble. Space. The rumble was his butt, right? It was Royal Rumble, parentheses, in my butt, which was the movie you saw. Is that correct? <laughs> Where somebody had stuffed glitter in there, and every time he farted, he'd say, well, that was a Royal Rumble. And <laughs> as evidence, he would point to the glitter. Like, that's... No, you're thinking of a scene from the documentary taken of the final days of the Mitt Romney campaign. <laughs> Ah, a Royal Rumble, the fumble of bumbles, the Mitt Romney story. If I remember correctly, that's what it was called. Uh -huh. <laughs> if only you would have shown that side of him, we could have been having president. You know what? Right that, is a, that is a glitter-filled butthole I could have voted for. It was this close. <laughs> Finally, a <laughs> shimmering anus we can believe in. How close are we, Cargill? <laughs> not, not even remotely. It's the story of two young boys, one of whom is abducted by fairies, the other uh, who makes a wish with a djinn, and how they come together in their youth and how that affects them over the course of their life, much like the plot of Dreams and Shadows by C. Robert Cargill. Uh, are you willing well, to no, say... This was, seriously, this was a layup of all five movies. The movie is called A Royal Affair. It's about a queen <laughs> who's married to an insane king, I, and she starts sleeping with her doctor. I, 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 and that's the movie. I that's what sworn. the whole thing's about. Okay, look, it's, I, that, it's that. It's called A Royal uh, Affair. Listen, uh, and you guys ended up with glittery buttholes <laughs> Shooting out over Mitt Romney's campaign <laughs> while, you know, monarch butterflies are in the back seats of Volkswagen doing it in uncomfortable places. Like, I have no idea what, where, Don't forget going of the all cloud. the things that came tonight, that I'll, is where you guys ended up. Cargill, that's why, that's why, you know... That's why we're famous on the internet. Is the, I, you know, We don't expect you Hollywood types to understand us. Our insight is deeper than most of your types. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, all right, look, man, let's go ahead and wrap things up here. Obviously, you got one thing to promote, of course, which is, uh, um, hold on. Uh, uh, oh, you mean Dreams and Shadows by C. Robert Cargill, yeah, available February 26th, but a anywhere where you buy books? What's weird, though, is there's still... now. Amazon.com, audible.com. There's still only one review, it says here. It's a one five-star review. Apparently, it's very popular. 
So oh, that's weird. They, uh, Amazon doesn't allow Amazon UK allows you to post reviews early. Amazon US does not allow you to post until the product is available. Huh. Uh, that, so how did your roommate do it? All yeah. Those fun people who posted early reviews of Lord of the Rings. Did, uh, did he pretend that, to be from the UK or something? How did he do that? No, um, he posted it on the digital version, which they hadn't locked up, and it carries over to both versions. And it has since been amended. Uh, but so nobody, nobody who's actually read the book is allowed to post their reviews. Amazing. But uh, apparently, my ex roommates found a way to slip on there. So uh, he has not read the book, sadly. All right, dude. At Massaworm on Twitter. What about you, Justin? What do you got to promote? Uh, not uh, JerryTalks.com. Um, go check out uh, the podcast where it's just me screaming and yelling. Uh, other than that, at Justin R. Young on Twitter. Is it J-R-Y or at J or J-U-R-Y talks? J-U-R-Y T-A-L-K-S. All right. I, got, I only got, uh, I, I released a, a tutorial for a magic trick. But it's only two bucks, and it's a good one. Head on over to Scam oh, Stuff. Oh, wait, so when, when is this other thing happening? You you called me and talked to me about that, and I haven't heard anything about that yet. Have you publicly talked about any of that yet? No. The other thing? Wait, which other thing? Can you give a hint? Uh, yeah, a certain magic trick that a certain... Oh, of sure. a certain book oh we haven't announced that. That we haven't announced that. We haven't... Announced that. We haven't, okay, well, we haven't yeah, yeah, no, that's why I'm being so vague. But yeah, okay. Soon I discover. But remember, it's the three coin trick. Tell me your secret, Earls! <laughs> <laughs> How many coins do you think are in there? Two. But you gotta remember, it's the three coin trick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How many coins do you think are in there? Two. Yeah, but you gotta remember, it's the three coin trick. Two! How many coins did you watch me put in? But of course, you got to remember, it's the three coin trick. <laughs> <laughs> how many coins did you watch me put in? Two. But you got to remember, it's the three coin trick. Tell me how you did that, or else. And we put it in there. Now, how many coins did you watch me put in? Two. Yes, yeah, right. But remember, it's the three coin trick. <laughs> Three? That's right. Well, if you're going to watch that closely, I'm not going to do the trick at all. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> How did you do that? It was amazing. <laughs>